you'll please take the Word of God. I want you to go with me to the New Testament, to the book of Colossians. We'll find our place in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we're looking at the phrase, seek those things which are above. And uh, we're talking about in seeking these things, obviously in heaven, the things that are above where Christ sits on the right hand. Um, we're talking about taking the high road, taking the high road. And that's what we call this series. And uh, we want to look at some more things here um, as, after we pray. Father, we need you tonight. We can only attempt to take the high road without you. But as we follow you, as we look to you, as we believe your word, as we yield to you, surrender our lives and let you work in us and through us, uh, then we can truly make the right decisions and we can truly follow you and and then take the high road in our life. We can seek those things which are above. And Father, that's what you put in us to do as your children. And Lord, help us to strengthen that and uh, truly be dead to ourselves here on earth and uh, alive unto you. And we pray you guide us our thoughts in these things tonight. Give us clarity as you speak to us. And uh, help, us, help us as we leave here to be different because we've obeyed you and what you've spoken to us about, and that we can carry out what you put in our hearts tonight as we go this week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We said there's a, there's a road that the Lord wants us to travel, and we're referring to that road as the high road. And maybe, maybe you can already say it, but maybe you will be able to say it here after we're done with this series and talking about it, but on the high road, we do not choose between the good and the best, or the uh, good and the uh, bad. See, I can't even say it. Uh, good and the bad, we choose between the good and the best, and we choose the best. And this is called the unending pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just keep pursuing Him. Uh, he keeps teaching us. We keep learning of Him and walking with Him and uh, we're finding some truths that if we are truly seeking those things which are above, it's not a one-time thing that we just one time we sought them and He gave us everything that we needed. And, um, and that's enough to last us for the rest of our life, whatever span that is. It's a, it's a daily thing, daily, hourly, second by second. We seek those things which are above and we keep Christ at the forefront of our thoughts and our mind and our hearts. And, um, and we stay dead to self. Um, now that's, we need the Lord's help for that. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about walking the high road. Now there's some things that are going to happen as we walk the high road and as the Lord directs us in our life and guides us. And we've already said that we make the Lord our goal when we're walking this way and that we don't make a goal out of the byproduct. So everything that comes out of seeking the Lord would be a byproduct. And so those things that are wonderful that the Lord gives us here on earth as a taste of what it's going to be like in heaven, those things should never be our goal. For instance, um, we want joy in this life or we want peace in this life. Well, that's not the goal. The goal is not to do certain things in order to get peace. The goal is to seek those things which are above, which is the Lord, and He'll give us peace. And he'll give us just a byproduct of being with the Lord. And um, that's something you have to figure out for yourself, how to walk with God and how to yield to him and, and, um, and, and be with him for him. Amen. Not for somebody else or for something. It's for him. And when, when he's enough, then, then the byproducts come. The byproducts come. Um, I was thinking about it even today, um, thinking about my life. I, I listen to preachers a lot on YouTube and, of course, good preachers. <laughs> they hold true. They believe the Bible. And they preach the Bible. Right. And, uh, and then I'm under conviction when I hear them. I don't feel better about myself when I hear them. I feel worse about myself because they're preaching the Bible and preaching the holiness of God. 
and I, and I realize and I think about, you know, when you hear certain things preached, I was thinking about it and thinking about, well, how did the Lord send me along a certain way in my life? And, and, and I look back and I think I wasn't seeking those things. I wasn't seeking to be who, who I've become. I wasn't seeking that. I was seeking the Lord. And um, it's so much simpler. That's why he tells us to live in simplicity and godly sincerity. It's just simpler to seek him. He didn't make a list for us. He didn't tell us to do all these things. Everything comes out of him. And so the simplicity is in him. And the godly sincerity comes from him and the heart that we need to have for him and walking on the high road. And I thought, you know, I didn't try to not do because I, sometimes I'd look at my own life and I think, how do people perceive me? How do people I knew growing up, how did my extended family members perceive me? Like, do they think that I worked really hard to become who I am today, and that's why I am who I am? You know, I just changed my life. You know, I just had enough willpower to do that. And I thought, well, no, that's not, a, that's not what happened at all. I never even thought that one time. Uh, after, right when I got saved, I never thought that, and I didn't think that moving forward. I just thought I wanted, I was so excited that the Lord saved me and that he would forgive me and uh, he'd give me eternal life that I was like, I just want to live for you. And I just wanted to be with him. I just wanted to talk to him. And I wanted to, to, to get in his word. And I wanted to be with other people that wanted the same thing that I wanted. And, uh, and then the Lord changed, just changed my life. And, uh, and that's, that's the goal is him. And then he changes you. Most people are trying to get all the byproducts and they never get the Lord. And they're living a, a very difficult life. <laughs> because you cannot produce the byproducts. Only the Lord can. So let's move on or we'll never get done. We must remove all the secondary causes in life. That's what happens on the high road. Uh, we understand that waiting on the Lord is not a waste of time on the high road. And we develop the right world view on the high road. Now tonight we want to look at this truth. Uh, just one tonight. And on the high road we are hopeful people. We're living in a world that's not hopeful. Or the hope is sadly misplaced. Oh, there's people hoping. You can talk about the political realm, and there's people hoping for certain things in the political realm. But they don't care about the Lord, but they're hoping for certain things to happen. And there's misplaced hope all around. I mean, we could talk about a lot of things. But we don't have to be a people that's discouraged in the time in which we live. Look at Romans chapter 15 with me. Romans chapter 15. Remember, as we're seeking the Lord, we're seeking those things which are above, He helps us to be hopeful people. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, the Bible says this, Now the God of hope, if you don't have that marked in your Bible, you might want to mark that phrase. That's a good phrase for you to remember, that He's the God of hope. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And so our Lord is the Lord of hope. He can help us. And in believing, the Bible says that that the Lord will fill us with joy and peace. I don't think it's that because we're believing that He's going to fill us with joy and peace, He gives us joy and peace. It's believing Him, right. who is the God of hope, and He gives us joy and peace. He fills us with that. And when you compare Scripture with Scripture, the only way He can fill us with something is when we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. And it says it comes through the power of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. And so as we're believing Him and yielded to Him, He gives us that joy and He gives us that peace. And the Bible then says this, that you may abound in hope. Where there's joy and where there's peace and where there's the power of the Holy Ghost, we can not only have hope, but we can abound in it. Actually, we can abound in everything that Christ has. But, if you, but it's only walking 
and taking the high road. It's seeking those things which are above. You're not going to do that if you're not, if you're not seeking those things which are above. Only abounding hope comes through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. There's hope. There's no reason for a believer not to have hope. You had hope placed within you when you got saved. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, now shame on us that we don't, that we don't access that by faith the hope that he has for us. This hope, when we're speaking of hope, we're, it's something that we're expecting. There's an expected end. We believe something's going to happen. We're holding on to this hope because the Lord has given us hope. He's told us. And in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, the Bible says this, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, Jesus Christ is our great God. And He's our Savior. And He's our blessed hope. We have Christ. We have hope. If you have hope, you have the God of hope, you can have abounding hope in your life. Things don't always look so good. In circumstances in your life and in my life, all around us, what people are doing, doesn't look very good. But our hope, the Bible says here, a blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in the second coming of Jesus Christ. A lot of people look to it and talk about the second coming, the second coming. It's our hope that it's the second coming. No, no, no. It's the Christ of the second coming. Sure, be excited about the second coming. But don't be excited about the second coming because it's the second coming. Be excited about who's coming. That's, right. that's, that's, that's the blessed hope. Amen. Not that there's a second coming. It's Him. And, and, and again, that goes the goal and the byproduct. He's, he is the hope. He's coming back. And we're not looking for our disappearing. Some people have their, again, hope misplaced. And they're saying, you know what? This world's getting so bad, I can't wait till I just disappear out of here till the Lord catches me out. At least those that believe what the Bible teaches about the rapture, that he's going to catch his people out. Well, yes, but that's the wrong way to look at the rapture. We're looking at his appearing, not our disappearing. He's coming. We're supposed to look for him, not for, not for a disappearing. And it's very possible that we, that we become discouraging people instead of hopeful people because of what we realize the end times hold for this world. And if we're not careful, we're going to latch on to the things that the world is saying little by little, and it's going to discourage us. And we're going to get the wrong mindset and thoughts about things. And we're going to get our mind on the things that are going on in this world and get discouraged instead of being hopeful people by looking for the blessed hope that's coming. Instead of letting the Lord give us power, we're going to look at everything that's going on and we're going to be overwhelmed and be a people living in fear instead of hope. People need hope around us. They need to know that we have hope. Look at Romans chapter 1 with me. So we're going to talk about some of those negative things going to happen. But you don't have to be hopeless. We know it's going to happen because the Bible says it. When we go to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, I want you to go to verse 18. And what we find here is the downward pattern of a society. And we find our society in this downward pattern. And so what we're finding here is first, we're going to, read, we're going to start reading in verse 18 down to verse 21. And what we're going to find is they held the truth in unrighteousness. There was a time when our nation and our society did not hold the truth in unrighteousness. 
They just held to the truth as a whole. Now, obviously, there's always been people like that. But as a whole, we were holding truth in righteousness. Churches were being planted. The gospel was going forward. Um, great revivals were taking place in the beginning of our nation and our country here. But look what the Bible says in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They were holding the truth in unrighteousness. They didn't, they didn't keep a clear conscience. They corrupted it. They did not believe creation. That's what this is talking about, our conscience and then our creation and then creation. It all cried out about God. The things that we can see talks about the things that we cannot see. And they held these truths in unrighteousness. And they've done away with them. And the Bible says they because they did not glorify God, they become vain in their imaginations. And then the downward pattern here is they also not only did that, but they changed the truth of God into a lie. So they held the truth in unrighteousness, and then they just went ahead and took the truth of God. They just changed it into a lie. They didn't start out that way, but that's the pattern. And the Bible says here in verse 22 to verse 25, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor themselves or their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Well, they started holding the truth in unrighteousness. Then they changed the truth of God into a lie. Very bold. Very bold. This is not, this is not true, is what they're saying. We'll tell you the truth. This is not true. We're going to tell you what's true. And, of course, they're not worshiping God. Now they're worshiping the creature more than the creator. And then the Bible says that the Lord gave them up unto vile affections. In verse 26 and 27, For this cause gave them, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. Use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error with which was meat. Vile affections. The Lord said, I'm just going to give you, I'm going to give you up unto vile affections. If that's what you want to do, if you want to not glorify me and you want to change the glory of God and you want to turn my truth into a lie, hey, be careful how long you resist the Lord. He said, I'm giving up the vile affections. And then that's not where it stopped because he gave them up and they were able to now do these things and they didn't think twice about it. But then it says that the Lord gave them over to a reprobate mind. Look at the remaining verses here. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, they knew it. They knew it. 
that they, might, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We're in the place where people are being given over to a reprobate mind. And what's interesting is when God gave them up to uncleanness back in verse 24, He was giving them up as individuals to uncleanness. As they desired that, as they were changing God's truth into a lie, individually they were given what the Bible says here, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. So the lust of their hearts, they were given over individually. Then the Bible says in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. So this is the second time it says that God gave them up. And He gave them up to vile affections, which the affections is plural, but He's speaking about individuals. As they continue this way as individuals, He gave them up to vile affections as individuals. But then it comes and says, and get, in verse 28, it says, gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's singular. A reprobate mind. He gave all of them over to a reprobate mind. Which makes me think as individuals, and obviously the individuals seem to be growing throughout the passage. More people were getting on board with it. But it became a national thing. And he gave the nation over to a reprobate mind. Just one reprobate mind. And sometimes I just look at our nation and look at things around us and say, is there a reprobate mind over the United States? Is this where we're at? I mean, are they not only know that there should be judgment on this, but they're doing the same things and they're having pleasure in them that do those things? And now they can't, they can't even process things correctly because they're so far gone in their minds and the devil's blinded them so much I don't know but I know that things are getting bad and things are getting bad quick in our nation I've never seen bigger babies on TV crying about things pouting about things declaring things to be right when obviously they're wrong and um, just because they say it multiple times makes it right. At least that's what they think. And they pound it and pound it and pound it until they are on board with it. And they believe it. And they want us to believe it. But obviously we know the truth. So we understand things are getting bad. Go to 2 Timothy with me in case you didn't get enough of it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We know what the Bible's saying. We see it unfolding before our eyes. But listen, we don't have to be hopeless. My hope is not in that people do the right thing. Is that where your hope is at? If only we could get somebody in office that did the right thing. That is not where my hope is at. I would like somebody in the office that did the right thing for president, right? I would like that. But that's not my hope. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is that he comes back before that. We have to be hopeful people. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 1 and follow. We're going to read the whole chapter. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. So the last days have been ever since Jesus Christ. We've been in the last days. We're like in the last hours of the last days. But in the last days, it says this, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now listen at this list of things. And you just think about when you go to Walmart, the things you see on TV, the things that you see around you, and think about, do you see these things? They're lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, 
having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. That's not a good description right there. People that resist the truth, they have corrupt minds, they're reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Now we're going to continue to read, but I can see our society in these verses. And it's only getting worse and worse. Only in the past three years have people been able to get on TV and say the things that they say on TV. They always said those things behind closed doors previous. And now they're saying the things that should be whispered. They're saying them out loud. I never thought. I knew they would lie behind closed doors. Right? And I knew people would say certain things that they, that they were doing behind closed doors, but never come out and tell everybody else what they're doing. And they're just doing that. Yep. And they're living this way. The Bible says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But, in case that wasn't bad enough, you're going to suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get worse. It's getting worse and it's going to get worse. If you live godly, it's going to get worse. But, continue. Continue. Continue to doing the things. Paul said, I'm just going to continue. You know what I'm doing. You know my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my long-suffering, my charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions. It doesn't matter where I was at. I was still doing these things, whether if I had Antioch or at, at Lystra or Iconium. Persecution came, evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. Just continue. Go to the next place. Just continue. But continue in in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You know, we don't want to see the worst in everything and then start anticipating problems and then become discouraged instead of being hopeful. That's not where we want to find ourselves. So we take a truth that we know that as men go downward in a pattern away from God, they get worse and worse. Eventually to a reprobate mind. But we're to continue. And we're to be hopeful in the middle of all that. I don't think the Apostle Paul was discouraged. He should have been. If if anybody should have been discouraged, it should have been the Apostle Paul. (laughs) I mean, we haven't been through near as much as Apostle Paul. He said, but just continue. Continue in the Word of God. Continue in the things that you've learned. Continue following the Lord. He's telling Timothy here, continue. And you know, maybe you don't struggle with it, but I personally have to be on guard against this because I'm a perfectionist. And I want things to go right. And they don't usually go right. 
and I have to have the Lord to help me. <laughs> or I'm going to be discouraged, and I'm not going to be very hopeful about things in my life. And the Bible's telling us here that we are to turn away from evil men, and we're to continue in the things that we are assured of. What are you assured of tonight? Are you assured of anything tonight? Can you just grab onto one thing from the Lord tonight and be assured in it? Are you assured of your salvation? Are you assured that you have the word of God? Are you assured that, that the Lord is with you and that even when the persecution comes, that he's with you and he's going to help you? Even in the dark world that you can still live for him, are you assured of that? Are you assured that he can make you, uh, he can thoroughly furnish you into all good works? Just because everybody else is, is uh, reprobate and going away from God, are you assured that he can keep you? What are you assured of tonight? Because he said you're going to continue and you're going to continue the things that you've learned and you're assured of. We learn a lot. They, these people that in the last days, they learned and they never come to the knowledge of the truth. Sounds like they were watching YouTube a long time. Learned a lot. Never come to knowledge of the truth, though. We can learn some things. You can come to church, but what are you assured of? What have you made your own? That's where the hope comes from. It comes from the Lord because He's given us assurance. Hey, bad times are coming. We're in them. Be hopeful. You can have joy. You can have peace. You can have abounding hope because we have the God of hope. Amen. So there's no reason to uh, paint a pretty picture and say, hey, everything's going to be okay. Hey, we're almost at the end of the rainbow. Your pot of gold's waiting for you. Hey, just look up. Can't you see it? All right, unicorn's going to come and take you off and ride you in the sunset. It's going to be all happy. Why? There's no, there's no reason for me to tell you that. But I can tell you that the Lord is faithful. And if he's God of hope, he's faithful to give you what he said he'll give you. See, we need to be complete in Christ and declare wickedness, but not without the message of hope. So even if we get into conversations about people about how bad our nation is going in the wrong direction, we still need to give them a message of hope. We need, still need to tell them where our faith is placed. And it's not in whether our nation crumbles or gets better. It's in the Lord. Look at Luke with me. Luke 24. So what's taking place here is the Lord has died and he's been buried and, hey, he rose from the dead. Praise the Lord for that. And in verse 21, we have, um, we have the disciples here, two of the disciples walking And they're talking, and then Jesus comes up, but they don't realize it's Jesus. And look at verse 21 of Luke chapter 24. And they said this, But we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. You see what they said there? They trusted. Past tense. They had hope that what he said was what was real. And they're, they're discouraged right now. They don't realize this is Jesus that rose from the dead. They're saying, but we trusted in him. We trusted that he was the Messiah. And they're just a little down on their hope right now. Look at verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, that's Jesus Christ, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's what he talked about, himself, throughout all the scriptures. What a Bible class. Then verse 32 says this. And they said one to another, so this is Jesus, they were with him, and then he vanished. 
And then they said this, and their eyes, I'm sorry, in uh, verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And by the way, the Lord's got to open the scriptures to you. You know, we walk with the Lord. He opens the scriptures to us. He'll help us. But they said their heart was burning. See, they, they trusted in past tense, meaning that they lost their hope. But Jesus preached to them concerning himself, and once again their hearts began to burn within them. Hope started rising up within them. When they realized it was Jesus, their hope was new, and I can't help but to think it was probably abounding. And they wanted him back, talking to them again. Our hearts need to burn for Jesus again. Amen. We need Jesus to teach us again, personally. We need to get along with Jesus and let him help us. Give us that abounding hope. It can never get anywhere else but it, until it starts in our own hearts. Then it can get to other people's hearts as we can give hope to them because we can give them Jesus. Look with me at Romans chapter 5. We're talking about this message of hope. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 8 and verse 9. I want you to notice when we read these verses, there's a phrase I want you to notice. And the phrase is much more. If you mark things in your Bible, you might want to underline that phrase when we come across it. Much more. More. Very encouraging. The Bible says in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Much more. Much more. We're saved by His blood, but we're going to be saved from the wrath to come through Him. Much more. Look at, uh, look at verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of many, uh, through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded... Unto many, there's that abounded again, that abounding hope that we can have. His grace has abounded much more. Adam brought death, but Jesus brought much more. Look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense, talking about Adam again, death reigned by one, there's the phrase again, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Much more. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Somebody's got to say amen. amen. Okay, thank you. Grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Much more. We have a message that sin abounds. True. That's true. And sin is abounding today. But we follow up with the message that grace does much more abound. Amen. This world is wicked and it's and it's deceitful, and it's getting worse and worse. But grace does much more abound. It's enough for everyone. Grace abounds. Grace abounds for you, it abounds for me, it abounds for the lost man. It abounds. And being hopeful is being like Jesus Christ. Because he is hope. And we've got to be careful that we keep our eyes on the Lord because we need to be encouraging others. We need to help others be hopeful because, hey, 
What if we get to a point where we get our eyes off the Lord? Who's going who's to encourage us? We need people to encourage us. We need to be encouraging others. Hope. Keep our hope. Keep our eyes on the Lord. Keep our hope in the Lord. And no matter the situation and circumstances, we can be hopeful in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He wants us to be. And so as we seek those things which are above, as we seek the Lord, as we try to walk with the Lord, as we let Him work in us, we can be hopeful people. In the middle of a a world that's off the rocker. We can be hopeful. On the high road, we are in an unending pursuit of the Lord Jesus Christ, choosing between the good and the best and determining to choose the best. Father, help us tonight. There's not one in this room or one that will listen to this message that is not in need of hope. They might not even know you as their personal Savior, so therefore they don't know the God of hope. They don't know the blessed hope that you're coming back one day, Lord. Uh, they don't know that. And I pray for their salvation, that they would come to you and believe on you before it's eternally too late. And I pray for us as your children that we would seek you and keep our eyes upon you and know the hope that only you can give us in the middle of a, a hopeless generation of people and generations of people. Help us to respond the way you desire for us to tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I'm lost. I don't know if I die tonight, I'm on my way to heaven. Actually, I know that if I die tonight, I'm not going to heaven. And you don't have any hope. There's no hope when you die. There's no expected end. Or you might know that your end is separation from God in the lake of fire one day. I don't say that happy, and you shouldn't be happy about it if you know that's true. You should come to the God of hope, and He can give you some things to be assured of. In Him, in His Son, Jesus Christ, you can be assured of eternal life. You can be helped. Would you confess that you're a sinner to the Lord tonight and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and believe on His death, His burial, His resurrection? Shed his sinless blood to pay for your sins. Would you do that tonight? Believers, maybe you're just saying tonight, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to be a hopeful believer. Things around me look hopeless. Things at my job look hopeless. Things in my family, they look hopeless. Things in my personal life look hopeless. Things in my future look hopeless. Things in my nation look hopeless. Yeah? But don't major on the minors. Major on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is never hopeless. He is full of hope. He's full of hope. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth shall grow strangely dim. Look to Jesus. He's not hopeless. He has abounding hope for you. Seek those things which are above. Be a hopeful person. There's not a lot of people that you're going to run into that see hopeful people. You can run into anybody and they can be negative about everything in this world and you could agree about the negativity of this world. Well, God, let the Lord help us be hopeful. Father, I don't know what's in the heart of man tonight. I don't know. Even my own heart is decept deceitfully wicked. Um, but we just need you. If we're going to overcome the hopelessness of this generation and the generation to come, and be able to share the light of the glorious gospel that you've given us. We have to have hope. And so I pray you'd guide us in this today. Um, guide our minds and our hearts to, to hold your truth in righteousness. 
and to keep it truth and to, to not sell the truth, Lord. That you wouldn't give us up to anything, that you would, you would continue to give us everything that we need. That we can be what you want us to be for people that need an answer, that have looked everywhere but to you to find it. And please help that not be us, that we're looking everywhere but to you to find what we need. And we thank you for all you're doing for us. We thank you for your love. Where with you love us. Help us to choose the best, and that's you, as we walk with you this week. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.